folks. LT1 Meetup of 2015. It's a great crowd here tonight. Awesome venue. Everybody's got a drink? We're about to get going with a guest speaker. Derek Clouds is, is a field applications engineer with Freescale Semiconductor. Has more than 35 years experience with uh, electronic control systems. During his 26 year career at Motorola and Freescale, he's developed considerable practical experience using single chip microcontrollers of all sizes. You gotta check out the, this thing. Believe it or not, uh, there's a little square in here, there's a microcontroller in here. Maybe he can uh, tell you about that because that's just crazy. <laughs> All right, so please welcome me, uh, welcome Derek to the stage. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, just let me know if it gets too quiet, let me know if I get too fast. I tend to talk real, real quick because I get too excited about most of this stuff. As, as uh, Ian was saying, I'm an application engineer with Freescale. I've been working with uh, Motorola and Semiconductor since, when did I sign on? 1988. I am a very old guy. Uh, I had about 10 years experience of course on the Freescale, uh, sorry, the Motorola. Um, this is going to look a little like a sales pitch, but it's not. Uh, Freescale is a semiconductor manufacturer. We don't directly manufacture anything that goes into IoT applications. We basically make the things that make the things possible. Okay, so microcontrollers that go inside of IoT applications. I'm going to show you some of the things that we do, how we're uh, organized, how we're set up. We focus mainly on five different uh, technologies to keep our technologies all focused and we keep a concentration on four separate micro, uh, marketplaces. And we see IoT, we saw IoT probably about six, seven years ago, I would say. We've been doing a lot of machine-to-machine -machine applications, M2M, M2M over the cloud is really what IoT is. So it comes a little second nature to us. About 45% of everything that Freescale manufactures today goes into a vehicle. And I just lost my feet. Vehicle today in production, average car in production today has approximately 40 to 60 microcontrollers in it. Typically, you'll find five microcontrollers at the driver's door alone. Most people really don't know where we are. We're everywhere in that respect. Um, one of the things we're seeing is IoT applications actually coming into the cockpit of the car. Right? So we're saying end users are used to having all these gadgets inside the vehicle. Approximately about half the cost of a car today is part of electronics components themselves. So, thanks. <laughs> if you want to cut the car in half, just throw away electronics. Um, we are very big in the, in the powertrain, uh, in the cockpit as well. And the cockpit's really where we're seeing a lot of the IoT applications. One of the other marketplaces that we focus on is networking. Uh, we do a lot of blade servers, networking processors. Try not to be too distracted. Basically, the networking processors, you could say, are the cloud. I think it's more numbers. So we do a lot of things with cellular base stations, a lot of things with uh, servers that Cisco built, as an example. Um, so we're seeing a lot of IoT applications at the cloud level in that respect. We're also doing a lot of things in, there we go. It's gonna warm up. Just gonna see if it can catch up to me. So as I mentioned, we're seeing IoT applications in the cockpit, cockpit of a vehicle itself. Okay. Networking, again, IoT, IoT, no big surprise, is where the, all the uh, big data applications are. We do a lot of things in industrial applications, from factory automation all the way to healthcare applications, and once again, over and over and over again, we're seeing our customers tell us we need to understand IoT. Is everyone seeing a theme yet here at all? Okay. No big surprise, in consumer electronics, once again, IoT shows up. So we're seeing IoT applications virtually in every single customer we talk to, and every single engineer that I talk to, everyone's asking, how do I get involved in IoT? What does this IoT thing mean? And we are trying to enable people to come up with IoT, more interesting IoT applications. Uh, we are literally already sprinkled everywhere. Uh, the big difference between IoT and, as I mentioned before, M2M or machine-to-machine -machine calculation uh, cal uh, communications is the cloud. Okay. So we have applications and processors in every single one of these uh, scenarios. We understand a lot of these marketplaces. I would, I would argue that probably in about 75% of all applications that you see here, we're already well, in, uh, well ingrained and in understand exactly what those the needs are. One favorite slide of mine, the one that Cisco came up with, is this one here that tells us right away that today there are already three times more things connected to the cloud than there are people on this planet. And in five years from now, that is going to double. Now I show this to a lot of engineers my age and older. There are a few left still. They don't understand it. 
They'll, you know, how can there be so many things connected to the cloud? And one of the things we see as a big growth opportunity, I believe Cisco sees as well, is in the avenue of wearables. You imagine for a second that not only is the car connected, but I'm connected with 10 different things on my person. Maybe another 20 different things I have at home. As I said, it's a big surprise to a lot of people that how many microcontrollers are already sitting in a vehicle. Most people don't realize that in your average home, you probably have more than 100 motors. Does anyone know that? Yes, spend some time counting them. It's really surprising how invasive all this stuff is. So we have a lot of people doing interesting things and talking to us about doing a lot of interesting things, and they want to make everything connected to the cloud in that respect. What we have done is we've teamed up with uh, an organization called the Warp Board and basically helped them develop, develop their own reference design. So this is not a free skill design. Warpboard.org is their own uh, organization. It does use a couple of it does use a couple of key free skill microcontrollers and microprocessors. The form factor is probably a little bit too big for most IoT kind of applications, but the idea behind this is. It's a reference platform where you can run Linux on it, run a display off of it, and try a few ideas out. That's strictly what it's there for. Okay? I can't get these before anyone asks. Okay? If you're, if you're interested in buying one of these, you need to go to warpboard.org. Okay? And they're, I think, this, well, I have no idea what the price is anymore. $120, $140 in some area. Now, when I show a lot of people this first picture up here, um, question mark I get is, you know, this is all very nice and very fancy, but, you know, do you realistically expect things to show up in rings? I mean, you know, am I going to have my wedding band connected to the cloud? How realistic is that in all reality? You know, is that something that's looking out George Jetson wide out in the future? I'm going to tell you right now that this is actually possible today. Freescale manufactures the world's smallest 32-bit ARM processor. This package is 2 millimeters in one dimension and 1.6 millimeters in the other dimension. I have a handful of them here if anyone wants to see them firsthand. You can play uh, Find the Micro. <laughs> As I mentioned before, there's a 32 bit processor on board running at 48 megahertz. It has 32K of flash, 2K of RAM. This is a general purpose microcontroller. It has shield communication ports, has analog pit ports, has timers on it. I can run this off a of crystal and it will draw about one micro ramp off of a, ba a battery and maintain a real-time clock, okay? To get a source of reference of what that really means, if you take a look at what, I, what I've seen as the smallest button cell or the smallest coin cell battery you can get in the marketplace today, using a battery as a power source, one microamp is gonna last about three years. So now all of a sudden a ring becomes a little more possible. Okay, so what's missing on this is no Bluetooth communications, this is really a general purpose microcontroller. As I said, we don't know what people are going to do with these things. We're trying to enable them. It's a very, very tiny package in that respect. When we come back to the cloud, the cloud itself we see is edge nodes, gateways, and the actual cloud itself. There's a variety of different ways of connecting them, wired and wireless. We uh, provide a variety of solutions for these, and there goes the thing again. So a series of other 3D processes that serve as the idea of making gateways. And one of the things that I focus very heavily on is 3D general purpose microcontrollers like the one I have here in my hand. Okay, so I try to work with people as best I can to try to give them the enabling technology to enable them to be successful in IoT applications. Uh, about six years ago, Freescale had exactly zero microcontrollers based on 32-bit ARM processors. Today we have a thousand. So there's lots of different variety. This is just one of a thousand. Is anyone looking at the monitor anymore? No? Okay. I'm just going to keep on talking until someone tells me to shut up. <laughs> We have a variety of specialized processors that deal with motor control applications. We do have ones to do wireless. If you're looking at sub gigahertz communications or 2.4 gigahertz communications, we have solutions for that as well. Uh, we have um, general purpose microcontrollers like this one. The have also microcontrollers built for automotive solutions that already have automotive transceivers built into them. Effectively, if there's a microcontroller application, for the most part, I've got something that might fit. I'm not the only game in town. There's lots of other competitors that build ARM-based processors. Uh, if you're a design engineer, you're looking at using a 32-bit ARM core processor, you're not doing it because Freescale that makes it. You're doing it because Freescale has it, NXP has it, TI has it, Atmel has it, who did I forget, ST has it. Today there's about uh, 15 to 20 separate microcontroller vendors that are all based on the same CPU. That makes it very easy for people to design their software and migrate to another processor from another company if that makes economic sense to go do so. Okay, so it's by no means a closed system, it's actually a very open ecosystem. It's one of the reasons why we jumped into ARM in a big way. 
In the uh, Cortex M4 CPUs, we have speeds that go from 50 to 150 megahertz, so a whole variety of different peripherals on board. For the smaller base processors like this, most of, most of these are running at a lower speed. Uh, if anyone's still using 8-bit processors or 16-bit processors, this wave is coming, right? A chip like this can be had for the neighborhood of between 50 and 75 cents in single piece quantity. So if you think you need to be a high volume customer, take a look at everyone's website. These things are cheap. Sorry, cost effective. <laughs> <laughs> One of the big focuses we have, especially with the smaller microcontrollers, is power consumption. I mentioned before with the one device I showed you, the ability to last three years on one battery is a very big application for us, especially again for IoT. One of the things I joke about a little bit is IoT is to be very successful and so is EverReady. I recommend everyone buy stock in battery companies today because I don't know how we're going to power all these things. I've been talking to a variety of students in, what, in uh, um, universities and colleges and I'm basically telling them that IoT is coming and if you can come up with an idea to power these things without using a battery, you're going to be a millionaire overnight. I talk to a lot of students about ideas like kinetic energy. If I have something on my body, I'm moving all the time. Why well, don't need a battery? Right? For a part that draws one microamp or 10 microamps or 100 microamps, I don't have to have a big battery. I don't have to have the big kinetic energy source. So I'm talking to a lot of students, encouraging them to come up with alternate energy power sources. Because those are really what's going to make IoT possible, quite frankly. Questions? No? I'll just keep up. One of the things we also do is we focus on microcontrollers, but um, in IoT, uh, one of the big uh, pushes of getting the data itself, the data itself tends to come from sensors. Okay, Sensor, sensors really is where all this data is coming from. So Freescale does manufacture a wide variety of sensors. We have accelerometers, we have gyros, uh, magnetometers, etc., etc. And depending on what you're trying to do is going to dictate what kind of sensor we're looking for. You know, how important is it for me, for example, to... to know which direction I'm facing from a compass direction. I mean, an e-compass for applications like that. Do I need to know how I'm moving? I may need a gyro for that. Or even Excel to me, accelerometer. Um, as I mentioned, we, we do manufacture sensors uh, targeted predominantly currently at smartphone applications. So the kind of packages that have in the sensors here tend to be two by two millimeter, three by three millimeter. Everything's really, really tiny. Okay. One of my favorite slides that shows you how an accelerometer works. Okay, so this is an XYZ accelerometer, microscope picture. On the x-axis, where I can see I'm moving in, so moving in this direction, the x-axis. All the sensors really do is measure changes in capacitance, changes in resistance, and potentially changes in inductance. I'm not going to measure changes in inductance at a silicon level. The way the accelerometers all work is they're measuring changes in capacitance. So in the x-direction, the die is actually moving in this direction here. And what I'm actually doing is measuring the change in capacitance and the plate, the plate difference itself. Hopefully I'm not the, not the only electronic engineer in the room. <laughs> okay, so the X direction I have capacitors. In the Y direction I have capacitors that are obviously 90 degrees to that. And what's really interesting in this, at least from my perspective, is how we do stuff in the Z axis. The actual mechanical mass not just doesn't just move in X and Y, but it's actually a trampoline effect as well. It's held actually about two thirds down the middle. And what I've got at the edge here is I've got little squares that are actually, again, capacitors. And what I'm doing about is measuring the capacitors as they jump up and down the trampoline. This is an accelerometer that's in your smartphone today. It doesn't have to come from Freescale. There's a couple other guys who manufacture it. But fundamentally, this is how these things all work. We're measuring small, small changes in capacitance. We're talking femtofarads. Tiny, tiny packages. And that basically tells us which way you're going. It tells my wife what floor I'm on in a building. I don't know why she can smell that. <laughs> Sensors are one thing. Microcontrollers are another thing. One of the things we realized a long time ago is people have uh, are spending more and more time doing software engineering. Back in my day, 30 or 40 year, years ago, we, I used to build 19-inch card racks. In those 19-inch card racks, I'd buy a CPU card, I get a digital card, I have an analog card, I have a whole bunch of different cards, and I'd finally build a system on a 19-inch rack. That entire system now is in my small little microcontroller. Hardware engineering is almost irrelevant. Any of hard, hardware engineers don't remember? <laughs> I always get upset about stuff like that. The hardest thing with hardware engineering now is make sure that we don't drain the battery too fast. Make sure we understand what the power supply looks like. And, you know, make sure you're not emitting too many radio frequency noise uh, emissions. So there are, you know, I'm going to trivialize it a little bit, but hardware engineering for the most part is not the same as hardware engineering was 30, 35 years ago. 
So we're building a lot of things in the microcontroller and put a lot of memory inside the microcontroller. Customers today that I'm running into are spending at least 80% of their engineering resources on software development. Does anyone think that that number is too low? Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's closer to 90, probably 95. Right. Some people I know are just basically buying a board that already has everything, all the hardware done on them and they're putting all the software on top of it. So they're spending all their time doing software. Okay. So sensors are nice, microcontrollers are nice, but software is really where the magic is. So part of what we're doing as well, especially in the sensor avenue, is coming up with sensor software. Um, if you ever get a chance to play with sensors, you realize that what ends up happening is you get the stream of ones and zeros, and you're now expected to turn that into north, south, west, and east. You're expected now to figure out what that does it mean on a map or what floor is a person on. I have a, an altimeter sensor that knows where I am in increments in 30 centimeter steps. So every time I move a 30 centimeters up or down, the value of the sensor actually changes as well. But all it's doing is giving you a number. It's not translating into anything. We have what we call sensor fusion software, which we have available in source code for free off of our website to help people understand or help people make sense of all this data that's coming out them so they can massage it, do what they have to do to it, get it up on the cloud. Right? IoT applications are basically putting stuff up on the cloud. Without sensor fusion software, you're looking at spending probably two to four years trying to get all that code together to figure out how, what all this stuff looks like. As I mentioned before, this code is offered for free. You are not even obligated to use a Freescale sensor. It's not tied to anything. Okay? We're simply trying to enable people to get things done as quick as possible. In conjunction with that, we have a variety of hardware platforms. Everyone's heard of Arduino. Yeah, so no Arduino platform uses a Freescale microcontroller whatsoever. Um, since we can't call our boards Arduino, we call them Arduino compatible. If you do have Arduino shields, and Arduino shield for the most part will fit with most of these devices. The uh, far left is a simple 32 microcontroller, uh, ARM-based again with 128K of flash on board, and a USB interface built in. On the far right here, this is my sensor board. Okay, this sensor board actually has a, a couple of XYZ accelerometers, XYZ gyro, XYZ magnetometer, also has an altimeter on board. Okay, so it's a complete sensor platform. We typically couple this blue board with the black board together, and I actually have it set with me if anyone's interested in seeing it. We provide it to students in some of the sports, and some of the hackathons that they've been running in some of the schools. And what they basically do with the students really, what they're doing is putting that board uh, combination together, they're grabbing the Bluetooth data stream that's coming off of this board right here, and then putting it up in the cloud. So it's nothing more than an input device for them. But this is a platform to help people understand how they can build IoT applications in rings and watches and wristbands and anything else. Okay, so it's enabling technology. The board on the far left uh, is sells for $15 Canadian. We're, this is not a money maker for us. It's basically what our cost is. And so try to enable with software, try to enable hardware, get things going. Uh, this is a graphic that shows you how that platform works. I do actually have application code where I can show you the Bluetooth communications with my PC, for example. As you move the board, the image on the screen changes as well. And this is an idea, a very simple idea of what the software looks like. Uh, we're seeing more and more simple microcontrollers using real-time operating systems, which sounds horrendously ridiculous, but quite frankly is necessary in some scenarios. There are complete stack frames, uh, how to get data up into a wireless uh, router either using Bluetooth, using Wi-Fi, using Zigbee. Zigbee's really popular. There's a couple other technologies that are being used. And each one of these has a lot of software intensive work involved. We have a lot of that work already done and figured out. We try to help people get things done as quick as possible. We hate it when people waste their time. Right? You really should be wasting a lot of time. I also hate it when people don't understand how things work. If you're an engineer, you should know how a lot of this stuff works. Don't just take the stuff and assume it's going to work. I'll sit down with you for a few hours and show you how a lot of this, this hardware software actually works so you're a little more comfortable with it. Uh, one of the things that Freescare really pushes is not so much the Internet of Things, but the Internet of Tomorrow. This is a truck that we've been driving around stateside right now. It's been started off in California, covering most of the West Coast. It's actually got three stories on it. The second story is actually a training center. I'm um, hoping to bring this into Kitchener in October. This is what I'm shooting for. As soon as I find a place to park it. <laughs> it's actually a really big truck. But what we have on here is a lot of our customers' uh, IoT ideas, and IoT products. Um, one customer you may recognize that is on this truck is Thelma Clouds. Okay, Thelma Clouds I started working with about two years ago uh, and helped them getting some of our microcontrollers to work with their particular MIOS sensor. 
Okay, so that's one of our success stories in Kitchener in that respect where you know, they're basically a startup. I'm, we're always looking for startups, and the big reason for that, most of the most interesting things happening in IoT is happening from startups. Companies that have been around for 20, 30, 40 years are boring. Okay? <laughs> they, don't, they don't understand what IoT means. I have to sit down with these old guys and explain it all the time. They don't get it, okay? For some strange reason, if you're in college, university, you get it without even thinking about it. You understand it completely. You understand it better than I do. All I can try to do is help you get it done. You tell me what you want to get done. So, looking at tomorrow, all these microcontrollers, LC sensors, everything's fine. There are two key things that Freescale focuses on very heavily to enable IoT applications tomorrow. Okay? One of the big ones that some people may or may not have heard of is this thing called Thread. Has anyone heard of Thread yet? Okay? So Thread is a communications protocol that runs over top of existing networks. If anyone's ever worked with Zigbee, work with Zigbee, anyone? No? Okay, so Zigbee runs on 802.15.4, which is a standard protocol. Thread runs on 802.15.4. So if you have a Zigbee-enabled network today, tomorrow you could make it a Thread-enabled network. All it is is software. It's just a simple protocol stack. Thread focuses heavily on home automation applications. That's where Thread's main focus is. They claim to start looking at things in industrial applications, but quite frankly, then they start encroaching on what Zigbee does best. Zigbee's very good at industrial applications. Zigbee's not that good in the home. It's a little bit too fragmented. Zigbee has tried to be too many things to too many different people, and it's kind of gotten way too confusing. Thread was initiated by this one company called uh, Nest, which is owned by a company called Google, and they got together with ARM, basically, and those two big companies are basically pushing Thread. The Thread protocol stack will be for formalized, the first version of it will be finalized in, uh, end of, by the end of June. Freescale and Silicon Labs are the two semiconductor vendors that are today eyeball deep in Thread on a regular basis. I get about 30 emails a day on what happens, what's happening in the technical interrupts that, are, uh, that we're running with Thread. The other companies here are all looking and waiting um, to implement Thread because they're all today have applications that are being used in the home. Okay, Tyco does security systems, Sonki does automated uh, window blinds, Samsung everybody knows. Big Ass Fans is really a company. Uh, they actually built fans, believe it or not. Nest is thermo thermo um, thermostats, obviously, in an HVAC control systems, and Neil again is obviously interested in security. All home applications. So Thread is very heavily focused on, th on um, home automation. The reason this is such a big deal, and the reason why Zigbee doesn't really fit as well, is when you have edge nodes sitting on the Internet of Things cloud, you expect to have an IP address on the edge node. I cannot get that with Zigbee. Okay, Zigbee does not provide that with me today. Zigbee basically has to fake that through a router and give you access that way. Thread gives you IP accessing at the edge node. So that's one of the big deals. If you're looking at IoT, the way Thread is being constructed, Thread makes much more sense for wireless communications protocol than Zigbee does, even though they're working on the same 2.4 gigahertz network, even though they're working on the same IEEE 802.15.4 protocol standard. It's just a bunch of software, but the big deal with the software is we're taking the uh, six low pan protocol standard and driving IP address capability right down to the edge. So now my ring will actually have an IP address. And that to me sounds insane. <laughs> but that is what Thread really brings to the party. Okay? If you're not doing home automation, looking more industrial automation, we can talk about this a little later. Okay, so a couple of different bullets. I'll make sure everyone gets a copy of the slides later on. As I mentioned before, you know, these kind of applications we're looking at. So Thread is one big deal that Freescale is really pushing for IoT solutions. One other thing that we find that everyone is missing the boat on, and I mean everyone is missing the boat on, is security. What is the, st the, uh, the standard for security in IoT? Can anybody tell me what that standard is today? Does not exist. Any startup who's trying to build an IoT product, are you focused on security? Or are you focused on doing an application and getting it done? Yeah. That's one of the things we see as very worrisome is we're finding this, all these little taps into the cloud that are not secure. And we're basically opening up the, the cloud to you know, things we may not want to have access to and people we may not want to have access to as well. So one of the things we've learned over the many years is how to implement secure systems over broad-based networking. Cellular telephones, for example, networking with Cisco, et cetera, et cetera. We understand what security systems do. What we're doing in a lot of the microcontrollers that are being targeted specifically at IoT applications is implementing hardware uh, security accelerator modules specifically inside the microcontroller to address the fact that there is no security standard in IoT applications today. 
Okay, and there's a variety of different things you want to prevent. A lot of this is basically dancing baloney. Uh, a lot of the networks are turning into software-defined networks, and that brings its own security chance, uh, challenges into it. Uh, cars today, has everyone seen movies or uh, news articles where a bunch of hackers are basically cracked into a car? Yeah, that's completely possible. Now, when I make a car IoT enabled, you think that makes that easier or harder to do? <laughs> wow, right? And, and like I said before, 45% of what we do, 40% of what I do is in cars. I spend half my week talking to car companies, right? And we take a look at this, and you know, when Windows tells us they want to be the operating system in the car, <laughs> we laugh louder than anybody else does, right? Because it's, it's just ridiculous. They have to do a lot of changes in their OS for that to happen. But we really worry about the fact that, yeah, you know, the end consumer was, wants to have IoT-enabled features inside their vehicle, but the same token, they want to make sure that the guy sitting beside him doesn't take over his steering system. And today, to some extent, on some vehicles, that's possible because they didn't think about security ahead of time. We're trying to get people to think of security ahead of time. Okay, that's a very big uh, problem we're finding. Um, especially, as I said, with startups. Most of the most interesting ha things happening in IoT are all coming from startups. <coughs> Companies that have been around for less than three years are going to generate more than half of all IoT applications in two years from now. I am very heavily focused on what's happening here, and also what's happening in Southern Ontario in general, in IoT applications. Right? We'd like to enable people, but we want to enable people in the right way. Make sure we've thought everything through, try to help you as best as possible. Maybe a little bit self-serving to some extent, as I said, this sounds like a bit of a sales pitch. What we're really trying to do is try to help people uh, get IoT as efficient as possible. We mentioned before, most of IoT startups are focused on the application and not securing the application, securing the data screen itself, right? Uh, Bluetooth actually is not as secure as some people may think it is. Thread has that security ability, ability built into it. Okay, so that's part and parcel of what we're trying to do here. In conjunction with this, we're trying to do basically is have this startup incubator program inside of Freescale. We have focused on eight cities. Notice that Toronto's one of them, and by Toronto really is Southern Ontario. The reason it says Toronto is my office happens to be in Toronto. I spend one or two days a week in Kitchener Waterloo. Okay, this is where more interesting things are happening. Unless you think there's more interesting happening in the University of Toronto. Anyone think that? <laughs> Uh, to be honest, actually, I don't spend a lot of time with UFT, I spend more time with Ryerson. Ryerson has an incubator program as well. Uh, the one I want to do with the Velocity uh, Center, uh, we're trying to help them out as best as possible as well. Okay, so Toronto is one of the focuses for Freescale as a global corporation to try to find ways to fund startups getting uh, OT applications. Anyone wants to talk to me about this, I'm going to be around all night. We don't understand what this really means. We see IoT, we've been watching IoT now for three years or so. We've been basically trying to get our parts ready for IoT applications, but we don't know what your ideas are. We have no idea what you want to build. All we're trying to do is provide a technical, technical solution, a ways or a means of actually building itself. Okay, hardware, software, et cetera, et cetera. And as I said before, I'm not the only guy. All the semiconductor companies are basically trying to do exactly the same thing. I'm just trying to get a leg up, especially in the Toronto, Southern Ontario area, on helping people out that way. Another slide that shows where we're trying to put encryption in, in control. Um, that's pretty much the extent of what I have. Everything after this is a sales pitch, which I'm going to refuse to do because um, my sales guy in the room could tell his boss that I actually did say the word sales presentation, but I'm not going to subject him to that kind of marketing spin at all. If you want to talk to me about this kind of stuff, I can definitely show this to you later on. Well, we can open up for questions. Uh, we've got 10 minutes. If anybody's got questions, then that uh, would uh, be the right time to do it. Yeah, so, go ahead. What language is used to code your microphone? Most popular microcontroller language today is C. If you um, have larger memory, you know, for example, if you've got 128K of RAM, specifically RAM, C++ makes sense. Um, I have microcontrollers today that have 256K of RAM. Um, by the end of this year, I think we'll be introducing a device that will have eight meg of flash and probably uh, at least 512K, if not 768K of RAM on chip. Uh, we build a device today, actually, that's a dual processor, a Cortex-M0 Plus and a Cortex-M4, a dual CPU device with one and a half meg of RAM on chip. It doesn't have any flash memory on board, but it does, it boots off external memory. So C++ makes a lot of sense if you have RAM, because if you ever take a look at the code that C++ compilers generate, there's a lot of indirection in it, there's pointers playing in pointers and groups of other pointers, and that, that eats up a lot of RAM resources. In small, tiny microcontrollers, the kind of things I'm used to using, uh, C, 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 C. 
I know the University of Waterloo uh, actually started in January, a couple months ago, teaching the semi language and the ARM pro uh, processor. That's right, this is this January? You're going to be subjective to that yet at all? Well, you have to do the cold fire, you don't have to do it anymore. Um, I'm, I'm telling every student, every professor, every university, every college, students need to graduate and say they've got ARM microcontroller experience on their resume. I can program an ARM microcontroller in C, put that on your resume. And I'm telling students today, if you can't say that, get your money back. <laughs> um, a lot of schools uh, in Southern Ontario teach uh, free skill architecture. If anyone's gone to school uh, in the last, uh, let's say, 10 or 15 years, you probably learned the S12 microcontroller. If you graduated earlier than that, you probably learned the HC11 microcontroller. Yeah, two electronics at all. These are regular Freescale slash Motorola semiconductor processors that I'm telling people, don't use them. Don't, don't teach that stuff, you gotta teach ARM. Uh, because there's so many ARM applications showing up there and so many different ARM vendors above and beyond Freescale, that's really a disservice to students that just, to just learn the one proprietary Freescale architecture. But yeah, C, C is popular. I tell a lot of people what they should do is understand assembly language at a microcontrol level, but there's really no need to code in assembly. You'll drive yourself insane when you're looking at, you know, I think last going to tell you you've got to use C if you've got 4K of code, but realistically you will be sater if you do write it in C. I write everything in C. That's a long answer to a really short question. Because I don't see any other hands going up, so I'm just feeling, oh, here we go. Yes? Um, how do you ensure that security remains a priority when a lot of people make Yeah, so that's an education process to try to educate people as to what IoT really means and how they're exposing themselves and their products and their end customers uh, if they don't implement secure features in the data stream. Usually it's the data stream we have to secure itself. But it's, it's kind of a, an overall topology. Right? If, if I don't see security coming from the top down, I'm not going to put security in my system if as soon as I send my data up, it's un not secure to put it up on the stream. So it's really more a matter of a, a big picture story that we're trying to tell everybody that you really have to think of security from the beginning. Because security on the internet was never a thought process when it was created. Never, no one ever thought it would go out of uh, mili American military defense and a few small universities. That's what the internet initially started off with. So it is an education process. I, I can't say I've got all the answers. You just have to expose people to the idea that they have the security ability. So just to follow up, so will it take a major breach of data to really God, I hope not. One of the problems with IoT is it's kind of like the wild west right now, right? I mean, there is no governing body, there's no standards, and I don't see anyone really asking for that or wanting it. So it's going to come down to, you know, from an end user perspective, if I have a choice of say three different options, and one of them the data is secure. Chances are I'm probably going to pick that. So security is going to probably initial, initially start off as a, uh, an economic advantage or sales advantage or feature advantage in that respect over your competition. Um, that's probably the, the, the only way I can see it happening. I don't see anyone wanting to babysit the internet. It's just, yeah, it's just too late. It's just too late. So it's really an education process. You're trying to, you're trying to show people, at least at the device level, that you can do it here already and you need to do it now. Um, it's going to take probably three, five years for everyone to really get the message in a big way. I would say. You talked mainly about the edge. Yep. Does Freescale have everything from end to gateway to cloud? Yeah, we have processor in the cloud as well. I mean, I, I did have a slide that didn't show up. Not that that really matters very much. This kind of shows it here where for cloud solutions, if you're Cisco, for example, you're already using our Layerscape and Core IQ application processors. These are very big processors that tend to have multi-cores inside them, uh, obviously running Linux operating systems, etc., etc. If you're doing gateway solutions, Core IQ applications do in fact fit in those, depending on how big the gateway application is, but we have IMX application processors, which actually today show up in a lot of tablets, but they are used in more and more gateway designs. We have a couple of reference lines for that as well. Edge nodes themselves, from my point of view, because I'm a microcontroller guy, I focus mainly on microcontroller edge nodes. And the things like you know, jewelry and stuff that you wear in your person, for the most part, are going to be simple microcontrollers. 
Anything with a display, if you want to run uh, a Linux operating system or have a, a relatively sexy display on it, chances are something an IMX processor or that kind of level of device makes more sense. In the IMX, we're currently using Cortex A7 and A53 processors. In the, in the Kinetis, we're using uh, Cortex N series, M0 plus M4. Okay? Question I get on a regular basis is, Derek, I want to run Linux on my Cortex M4 processor. You cannot run real Linux on a Cortex M4 processor. By definition, the reason what, what makes it a Cortex M in the first place is there's no MMU. If you've ever worked with Linux, Linux does not work without an MMU. If anyone thinks Micro C Linux is real Linux, then we can have that discussion in the parking lot later on. <laughs> okay. Generally speaking, with motor controls and Cortex, or with Cortex M4 or Cortex M0 Plus, you're looking at real-time operating systems. And you know, if you think Linux is a real-time operating system, I really have bad news. For that. <laughs> that, that, so we're basically trying to address everything we can as best we can with our technologies. But everything here is an ARM-based process, right? In 2004, Freescale was born as a spin-off or basically cut away from Motorola. Anyone know that? No one knows where, that, where Freescale came from, right? Before 2004, I used to work for a company called Motorola Semiconductor. In 2004, Motorola Semiconductor became Freescale Semiconductor. So we pulled away from Motorola for a variety of different reasons, which means that I'm familiar with 8-bit, 16-bit, coal fire, 68,000 architectures when you go to Motorola days, right? Freescale has become an absolutely enormous ARM-based processor. And today, for example, the Kinetis microcontrollers, six years ago I had zero microcontrollers based on ARM. Today I have a thousand. I actually have a thousand different unique devices today based on ARM processors. That's more than I ever had in the 68,000 cold fire. Freescale has jumped into ARM with both feet. Other questions at all? Uh, sir, uh, yeah, Edge IP. Yeah. Is that IPv6 as well? Or, or IPv4? IPv6. <laughs> So there's one question in the back. Um, yeah, sorry, you were talking earlier about uh, the sensors that can, uh, I guess, detect within 30 centimeters or something. Is there a way for them to detect mass? Like mass. A, mass. Like an actual weight? Yeah. So you're looking at then a, a load cell. Freescale doesn't manufacture load cells, but fundamentally what you're looking at is a, if it's a silicon load cell, you're looking at stress of the silicon, you're measuring changes in resistance ordinarily. I have had uh, this one customer of mine a few years ago, they built a very interesting uh, technique where they, they, have a, they have a patent on it actually, where they, they have a polymer layer between two conductive plates, and as you put the weight on it, the polymer layer actually compresses a little bit. So what you're seeing here is a capacitor plate, and as the two plates get closer and closer, the capacitance changes. And so they basically translate this deflection here into an equivalent mass. But load cells are what I'm familiar with for most mass. It depends what kind of you know mass you're look, dealing with. A load cell can, for example, measure the weight of a truck. Yeah, that's what they mean. So you're looking for trucks and stuff? So yeah. look look on the internet for load cell. And uh, don't look on Freescale's website because we don't do it. <laughs> and I think I'm done. I really appreciate everyone's time and patience. Um, Yes, thank you very much, Derek. And he is available for more questions after if anybody wants to tackle him. He's got an orange shirt on, you can't miss him. But just in order to keep the event going along, um, we're going to break out for another networking session so everybody can top up their beers at this great establishment. So everybody get thirsty. The washrooms are over here. We'll uh, come back in a half an hour and get uh, the next speaker, Paul Bob. Okay? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.